that. And I know one of the provocations that the organizers offered us um, is whether it's time to compost the word education. And I've really been sitting with that. But at the same time, and like I at first was really drawn to it. And at the same time, I do sort of love having this one word that like can encompass homeschooling your kids and being a professor in higher education and working with these like long lineages of potters and all of that is education. So there's something still pretty beautiful and certainly salvageable about all of it. Thank you. I know Flavia said she's listening in. So I think that might leave us with Nathan and Nakasi. Anybody want to unmute? You can go. Hi, I am Nakasi. I am currently living in Vermont, um, but Guyana is home in South America. Um, been in Vermont for about seven years now. Um, and the generation that I identify with, um, is, I think I just want to say in somewhere in the in-between, um, not young enough, but also not old enough. <laughs> um, and learning from both groups, uh, which is also why I am interested in uh, this session. Thanks, Cassie. And I see that Nathan's put an intro in the chat. So just check that out too. I am Nicole Savita. I am um, I work as the network weaver for EcoGather, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. And um, I am also coming from Northern Vermont, um, Abenaki territory. Uh, I was drawn to this session because I, or to, to hold this session and convene this session, um, because a lot of what we are doing in EcoGather um, has turned out to be a practice of facilitating intergenerational learning spaces, um, sort of as a byproduct, as a secondary outcome of starting to take lifelong learning outside of the credentialed context really, really seriously. So several years ago when I was um, in the initiation phases of this project and working closely with Nakasi at the time on it, we, um, we got to a place where we you know, there were so many opportunities to create a certificate in this or a, a program in that, a series in something else. And for some reason, both of us just were like, not that into it. And we kind of realized that in the continuing education space too, like there was no accreditation for most of it. Um, if there was, it was usually about having people jump through hoops to prove something so that they could put what a certification, a badge on their LinkedIn, on their resume or CV. And none of it felt anything like what we wanted to offer. And so instead, I just like I remember the day when I just kind of threw it all out because <laughs> Nakasi had asked me like how to go about making the certificates for something. And I was like, I don't know, you go on Canva and you make them and I sign them. Um, and that felt so silly. Um, and so we stopped doing that entirely. And instead, um, although we will do it. <laughs> Sometimes if someone asks because they need it in order to get access to funding from their employer to be able to take a class or to use, you know, work time or something like that. Um, but instead, we really started focusing on the fact that so many of us were educated in a way um, that prepared us meticulously for a future that is no longer promised and was probably never honestly offered to us to begin with, which is to say that all of those promises of everyone's upward mobility and kind of arrow of progress and modernity was all premised on and, and increases in accessibility and inclusion and justice and equity through all of that was always hiding the lie um, that it always requires extraction from somewhere. And not really taking that seriously, just sort of papering over it. And um, I am, you know, I am the recipient of that kind of education, a part, have been a participant in it as a student many times. Um, I was a really good student in the ways that schools wanted me to be. Like I'm one of the, the people who arrives in this space, um, having had a relatively easy time navigating traditional education, but always feeling mad about it. Like I could do it, but it wasn't feeding me. It felt very one way. 
And um, yeah, the more and more we just began to reckon with what some people call the meta crisis, what we call collapse, we recognized that like there was a need for adults certainly to be learning anew without having to go back to college, without having to go get another graduate degree, because I did that too. I got a couple of those. And then um, even as a first generation college student, you know, I went like all the way and kept going. Um, and and then as a professor, I kept seeing people coming back to grad school, sometimes to get a second and third graduate degree, because they were trying to make sense of something that wasn't really being made sense of in those contexts. Um, but the alternative felt like, well, you can keep learning. Certainly there's like no shortage of things to learn from on the internet. There's no shortage of things to learn from um, in books, but that feels really lonely. Um, and I feel like learning is very much a relational process. And so we wanted to create spaces where um, we could take that learning seriously in community. And EcoGather um, shaped up around that in a lot of ways. And I also happened to wind up with a fairly young staff um, throughout the project. I think everyone has, other than me, <laughs> has been um, in their mid-20s to early 30s. Um, and that's just sort of a happenstance thing. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to shift from being a graduate professor into being a mentor of younger people who could facilitate learning spaces. Um, and I've been really, really deliberate after I started to see the magic of um, allowing younger people to convene learning spaces for older adults. Um, well, for, for any adults, but for a group that might tend to skew a little bit older, um, I got really curious about what it would mean to not stop there and to keep going. And so that's part of the conversation I want to have today. Um, I did notice someone else join us who just arrived. I think your name says Sound World. Hey, um, would you like to just come on into the conversation? Let us know who you are, where you are, and what drew you? Another language. Another oh, do you, language. Need, do you need interpretation? No, no, no. Okay. And language is taken away by our elders because they don't know the languages that... There's this... I'm going to go reverse. Okay. So there's this Reggio Amelia thing. You have a hundred languages until you're trained out of 99 of them. Mm-hmm. And since yesterday, I've found at least two or three or four, maybe, new ways of communicating with myself and others. At least the seeds of them. Now, how I nourish them is on me. Now, the other side of this is your language is being taken away from you. Mm. And that is the work of our elders, per se. <laughs> Now, how do you reverse that is where I am. Oh, that's a that's a really powerful place to be coming in here with. And I I love that sort of reminder of how multilingual we are as babies, right? Um, and the many ways we know how we know how to express ourselves. Um, even thinking of the ways in which babies' cries um can be distinguished and are are deeply communicative. Um, and then all the other ways of communicating. So it's a really important piece to bring forward. Before we dive into this conversation, I would love to ground us in um, with a practice I call ancestral mathematics. And so I find that this works best. Um, certainly if you're driving, keep driving. <laughs> But if you are uh, somewhere stationary and you can either downcast your eyes or shut your video and just allow a little less input to come in um, while I walk you through this, I think that'll help. Biologically speaking, you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents. 
16 second great grandparents. 32 third great grandparents. 64 fourth great grandparents. 128 fifth great grandparents. 256 sixth great grandparents. 512 seventh great grandparents. 1024 eighth great grandparents. 2048 ninth great grandparents. For you to be born today from just the previous 12 generations, you needed a total sum of 4,094 ancestors over the last 400 years or so of modernity. Thousands of lineal relations collaborating toward the eventual biological possibility of your existence. Thousands of relations and so many of yours in common with so many others. But let's go back further. Homo sapiens have been around for about 300,000 years. If we figure that each generation takes about 25 years, roughly, roughly, that would mean that there have been 12,000 generations. And if we allow that exponential math to unfold and unfold and unfold, we get to, to the power of 12,000. And every calculator I consulted on that told me to stop counting. They all told me that we are infinity. They told me that we all come from all. And that, that is just our set of begats. That only traces the procreative lines. It says nothing about the care and the sustenance. Mutual sustenance is the archetypal relationship of life. So it is possible to say in contemporary English, without any confusion of sequence or cause and effect, that whatever sustained your first ancestor is your ancestor. You could call that one your original first ancestor, your dodem. And for the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, all of those dodemug are animals or plants, perhaps fungi. So let's take just one more moment to conjure our most inclusive ancestral memories, our most radically grateful notions of belonging, our wild, wilder, wildest wonder at life and its persistence, and the meaning it has without needing to submit it to words. Wonder for a moment. How many struggles, how many battles, how many difficulties, how much sadness, how much joy, how many love stories, how many expressions of hope for the future, how much learning, how much knowledge transmitted, how much knowledge lost, how much to be reclaimed? How much of it all did your ancestors undergo in order for you to exist in this present moment? And what can you give to the next? Should you take a couple of breaths there? 
and allow yourself to return to a more conversational space. Welcome to put your videos back on. Um, and if there's anything anyone would like to bring into the space after hearing that, um, I'll just open the floor for a moment. I also just want to introduce one more participant in this conversation. This is my child, Rowan. Rowan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Rowan. How old are you? I recently turned 11 years old. How do you learn, Rowan? How do you like to learn? I like to learn through hearing me. You like to learn through hearing me? Oh, that's a sweet answer. Rowan's going to sit and draw next to us and um, let us know if there's something that hits his ears from um, a younger perspective than we otherwise have assembled here that we might be missing. Okay. Will you tap me on the shoulder on my knee if you've got something you want to add? Okay. Thank you. Oh, I love you too. So much. Okay. Well. Wow, John, that is a pretty cool number to have been able to identify. What does it do for you when you are able to see that arrayed for you? You're talking about the 888 lunar month? No, the ancestors. I was just catching up on the chat. Oh, 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 yeah. Well, uh, I... I I put in the chat the, uh, the link to something called Big History, which is a conventional college course that I taught a couple of times. And it's, it's, it, it's a course that tries to compress the entire history of the universe into one semester's course. So you start out with the Big Bang and you work through the evolution of the planet of the Earth through all the different uh, extinctions that have gone on and uh, then finally uh, up to the beginning of human civilization and all the uh, permutations and migrations and things that have happened in human history and you know up to the present day and then projecting into the future so it's it's the best way you know all, all of my students have been in there you know most of them in their Teen, or late teens, early 20s. And so this has been my attempt to introduce them to looking at big picture things about, about and, and these are all students that are thinking about going into, you know, specializations, maybe they're going into the arts or maybe they're going into the sciences or humanities or whatever. And so it it's trying to kind of bring all these things together into one class. And I found it to be quite a transformative experience, not just for the students, but for me, because a lot of that stuff I didn't know that much about. So it was a real learning experience for me at the same time as I tried to communicate to the students. So anyway, that that was, I put the link, uh, one link to Big History Courses in, in the chat. Thought people might be interested. Very interesting to me. Thank you for sharing. So let's dive into just some co-created conversational space here. Um, maybe we'll begin just with a prompt of like, when you hear that phrase intergenerational education and try to map it to maybe the best of your experiences of it, um, what does that look like for you? What, you know, what does it mean? What has it been? And then we can use that as a way of um, figuring out what some of the challenges are, what some of those latent as yet untapped opportunities are, and dive in a little bit deeper. And I'm facilitating here, but this is one of these exploratory sessions, and I'm really glad to like share the space. Um, so if you've been feeling a little tired of kind of like being on mute and everything, this is a good time to just see how how much we can fill the space together. addressing some of the stuff for captioning. 
So I know I described one version of intergenerational education that we do in our weekly free eco gatherings. Um, and certainly another type is happening in Julie's house right now. Um, depending on the kind of arrangements, I would say, of power um, and status and some of the expectations, rules, norms around how people show up, it is possible to say that like all education is formal education is intergenerational because probably the people sitting in the seats, right? Um, and the person at the front of the room in the traditional sense um, are members of different generations. But when I think about it, I really instead think about that co-learning alongside and from each other where the education is moving at least bi-directionally, multi-directionally, um, and, and that it's less obvious um, to sort of discern a particular directional flow across generations. Um, so that's, that's part of, of how I fill that term in my mind. And then recognizing too, that like what I wrote in, in the description where I said, I hoped we could also consider and complicate a focus on generational perspectives and experiences by exploring the range of things like the colonization of time, the tyranny of developmental expectations, especially in the absence of developmental ritual, right? Um, and rites of passage. And that we could exchange insights across varied cultures, geographies, relations, and ways of knowing and being. Um, I, I really do think that like, at least some of the lessons of our nearest ancestors show up in our educational spaces. Um, and when we're in more ecologically and environmentally oriented education, often we are holding the interests of future generations, right? Like all sustainability education implies that we're sustaining something beyond the present. Present, But I think presencing the interests of future generations and presencing the stories and the, the survival stories of our ancestors and strategies of our ancestors is not something that automatically happens. So have any of you had an experience of intergenerational education you'd like to share or draw from? Um, I'll share. Um, I don't think my experience is very vast, but just to like um, throw it in there and start us off by sharing. But um, uh, the first thing that came to mind when you said intergenerational education was actually something very simple of imagining um, when I was sent on vacations to spend time with my grandparents and they were my caretakers during, you know, breaks and summer breaks and this relationship I had with them of of sharing and how um and how that relationship transformed over time from being a child to when I was an adult or even like in my 50s and my grandparents in their 90s um and my grandfather um calling me on Skype back you know when people used to use Skype guys um <laughs> like I've been trying to call you for three hours and I did it you know um so that was the first thing that came to mind about this like exchange between my grandparents over time. But um, in a more formal educational setting, though I don't really work in formal educational settings, my work with the Potters, um, when I think of generation intergenerational learning or education, I'm not thinking so much of age, though there are a variety of ages, but um, in generations of Potters mm -hmm. um, and like they at where they're at in their development as, as potters. Um, uh, some of them are maestros or masters in their trade who have you know, been doing it for 40, 50 years. Others are in that middle generation that grew up with their parents, but I mean, they're, they've still been doing it for 20 years. And then this new set of people and the ages, 
not necessarily young or children, though some are, some are even people finding pottery um, or coming back to it after um, their parents worked hard to send them to get a formal institutional education and they didn't wanna be an accountant. And so they came back to pottery um, and to the way of life of potters. Um, and so I think this is sort of the space more that I'm in and um, where I'm seeing the, the lines between generations is very blurred. Um, there's lots of mastery and knowledge in, in the hands and the body because of the nature of, the, of their trade and their craft. Um, uh, there's a lot of innovation um, and creativity coming from the younger generations, um, but there's just um, tons of kind of unspoken knowledge in the older generations. And one of the challenges we're coming to as there's some interest in formalizing more our knowledge community of joining um, a, a, um, a project here in Southern Mexico to make, um, they're called Universidades de Comunalidad, and it's like communal learning, um, the way that the people learn in villages um, in indigenous villages and, uh, and some interest in there being like a, um, a bachelor's degree in pottery, right? And it's so hard, the challenges are of knowing how you validate learning, how you certify it. I rail against it because it feels so strange. A lot of the potters who don't have a formal education maybe stopped at primary school. And so to be a part of the certification system, they couldn't even legitimately be professors in the university of which they have like thousands of years of knowledge in their hands. So I don't know these are some of the, the things we're thinking about, but in terms of intergenerations, um, right now we're trying to think of what would be our own way to recognize and acknowledge people's growth within our own community. You know, like what, is it time? Is it change? Is it, I don't know, like how do we, how do we, certify it or validate it in our own way amongst our community to acknowledge when people change phases of learning or what they're doing or what they're offering or taking. I don't know. Anyway, that's what I'll share. Mm, there is a lot in there. And I think I was really excited that you brought forward the skilling piece of it. And the fact that like so much of what I see we need now within education is the reskilling of things that maybe like the kind of upward trajectory of education has actually caused us to lose, right? So that's a really important piece of this. And, and I think typically a place where um, intergenerational configurations make a lot of sense. I mean, you're talking about um, doing some forest, man forest management learning and agroforestry learning, and there's no reason that my kids can't learn alongside my husband and I at this age that they're at now, upper elementary and middle school, right? And so like, just recognizing that if some of what we need to learn how to do is stuff that hasn't typically been centered in formal schooling, like does pushing it into those spaces, as you were just saying, like, actually take us in the wrong direction, and coming back out around, offer more opportunity. And finally, before turning it over to Greg, I'll add that I, as you were talking about, like trying to figure out how to sort of value and express where someone might be in their journey, um, reminded me of something that was discussed in the Queering of Money session uh, yesterday, late in the evening, my time, which was that they were talking about um, one of the alternative currencies having multiple values in terms of how, what it was equivalent to. Um, so I'm for, it was, I'm forgetting the name of the currency, but it was equivalent to $1 or like one of them was equivalent to $1, one peso or one minute of work. All of which you would not necessarily always um, e equate. Tumen, thank you, Julie. <laughs> And um, and so I wonder if there's something there to be able to have multiple ways, too, of thinking about demonstrating um, someone's education, right? Years in the craft, skills that have been um, developed or mastered, 
um, number of pieces made or fired. You know, I could just begin to think about ways in which you could count in multiple different ways and express in multiple different ways to get a more dynamic sort of credential or representation. I love that. Or contributions. Contribution. It's a beautiful yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah. So just drawing some of these threads across sessions, Greg and then Julie. Yeah, I'll pop in briefly and I unfortunately I have to duck out, but um, what came to mind in the context of uh, intergenerational learning for me was uh, the sacred circle dance community that I used to be part of uh, pretty regularly where it was not uncommon to have people, you know, who were in their eighties teaching and, you know, then maybe the next dance would potentially be, um, would potentially be taught in a, you know, by a 20 year old or something like that. And it, it came about partly, I think, because it's a more living tradition with, you know, dynamically content that's being dynamically created by the community. And so that, um, that means that there isn't, a right way to do it. In fact, one of my favorite sayings from the from the community is, "There are no mistakes, only variations." Mm. And uh, and that's you know that offers a space for a certain kind of learning um, that you know when you're trying to do higher mathematics or something like that just isn't an option so i don't know it's nice to think about places where we can engage with with people that have more flexibility around the content um you know you, you can't get art wrong so greg that really makes me think about um sort of also not falling into this like desire to pull everything into a reimagining like there are I always say like I want the people who are building the bridges to know how to build the bridges and have passed a test like for me still that feels really like important that certain types of skill sets that we all rely on for certain types of things like do need some demonstration of mastery Whereas others absolutely do not require the same levels of um, specification, certification, assessment, evaluation. And so like being able to hold the both and, and then also to recognize like, mm, we've probably like shoehorned way too many things into the assessment bucket and into the like prove it all out kind of format. And so the dynamism of a living culture and the work, as our friend Dougal Tyne says, uh, to regrow a living culture gives us space to have a lot more play there um, in our education, in our learning, and a lot more room for exploration. And I think for me, maybe one of the, the easier ways in to intergenerational learning is around the things that feel like they have the most play but what, what I would hate to see is then sort of a bifurcation, right, where people who are pursuing certain skills get tracked only in one way and miss out on all of the rest of the kinds of, you know, what often gets called soft skills, but I'm going to talk about as um, the real relational richness of other forms of learning. So thanks for bringing that in before you have to jet. It's Greg's birthday, everyone. That's why he has to go. And I'm totally going to embarrass him with a little just. Happy birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday to you. To you. I hope it's a really great evening, Greg, and the start of a wonderful year. Thank you. Take care. Julie. Hello. Again, um, uh, so I had so many thoughts when everyone was speaking, um, but I guess I'll just start by saying that, okay, when I think of intergenerational learning, my mind immediately thinks of grandparents with grandchildren. Um, and so in my experience, I didn't grow up with my grandparents for a complicated mess of reasons, um, but it was 
I think because of that, I have a yearning for it. I'm jealous of, you know, my husband. He's really close to his grandparents. I think that's so wonderful. Um, and then now with my own, I'm trying really hard to foster that relationship um, for them because I think that there's so much wisdom, knowledge, expertise, skills that they could provide that I could not. And being a homeschooling parent, um, I already can see in my own experience how much co-learning there is. When I started my co my homeschooling journey, it was very one directional. So I'm the teacher. I'm going to give you the knowledge during school time. And I learned very quickly that that doesn't work for me. Um, maybe it does for other homeschoolers. But for me, I realized, firstly, that life you're, you're going to learn through life. So we don't have to designate school time. We're mm -hmm. just always learning. Um, but secondly, that they're teaching me as much as I'm teaching them. Right. And I think a lot of people would say things like that, but I've learned it like so tangibly that, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. I've grown so much, just not, not even just by being a parent and I've grown, but they directly teach me things. And it's just amazing to see the, the, um, like that take place right in front of my eyes, you know? Um, so that was one piece. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking, well, I can't remember who in elicited this thought was um, intergenerational being going backwards in time, but also forwards in time. And I think that if you can take that perspective that we are learning something from our ancestors, but um, so I did this workshop about dance and movement and how the way that we dance and move um, comes from our ancestors that things that they have done in their past lives, it has written in our DNA of how we can move, right? So it's just this idea of um, epigenetics being transferred down the line. And if you think of it like that, you, you have to zoom out that what we are doing in our lives, in this one life that I have here, I'm going to write for my future generations what they will do and learn and move and be. So... You know, there's the forward thing, a, a backward thinking, but also a forward thinking when I think about intergenerational learning um, and maybe also what it like the importance of what I'm doing now in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the value I have. Um, and then last thought, because I also have to run um, is uh, so I'm not in a position right now in my living circumstances to be around my parents a lot and I don't have any living grandparents. And I, like I said, I crave that kind of knowledge and experience. So I just thought that biographies are just such a great resource to tap into the stories and wisdom and knowledge of people in the past, which um, maybe I can tap into that a little bit just by reading. <laughs> I love that. And I also love that as a potential activity. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of like well-preserved ancestry like in the ancestry.com sense of things um on my side of the family but my husband does and we've recently found a couple of um sort of self-written right autobiographies that were surfaced from a handful of his ancestors and like they must have taken a long time to handwrite uh, you know way back when and somebody figured out how to found them and type them up anyway just the idea that like we could also be leaving more artifacts of our stories and that we could be engaging our children in beginning to narrate ours and theirs and um, building that in as a practice of, of co-learning with fidelity um, in both mm -hmm. directions, backwards and forwards, and maybe even thinking about reshaping that into a spiral um, is something you can carry with you. Thank you so much. Thank this you. is a wonderful conversation and I'm really sad that I have to go. Um, but I will watch the recording when it does come out. So thank you so much. And thank I hope you all enjoy. Impressed, Julie. Bye. Any other thoughts just in this general space? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so it's going to be, I don't know. So what's the name of your child? Rowan. Rowan. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to invoke Rowan to 
surface what feels pressing because I have a couple of threads that have been running in my mind. The first being if you and Rowan are learning eating a new meal for the first time, are you learning the same thing? Mm. This thing, thinking and learning, what's happening there is, are we learning the same thing is the question. And if not, then if, if, if not, if yes, wherever, the question second to that would lead me to explore if Ronan, Ronan was five years old and you were 30, 35, 40, whatever it may be. But the thing is, what if you're, she was not fully responsible for her self? And what does that make a learning outcome different? Because... What I am regressing back to is, are we learning the same things? Mm -hmm. Then it comes to the point of, in, are you transmitting your learnings? And when you transmit your learnings, what comes back to you? Does it enhance the learning or does it diminish the learning? Does it play into it and reinforce it or break the, the pattern and make it more efficient to do something else? Mm. While that is brewing, what is what else is brewing is artifacts and the caution of creating artifacts. Because whatever we'll do over here is going to ripple out into the future. For now, you're using it for a good purpose, but artifacts and storylines and everything else, if they're not living, if they become dead, if they don't hold in them the wisdom that can be woven into things, to imbibe them by ritual or practice, if that's not there, and if it's in not in the right relationship when you're making it, how do you guess it will bring back that or will it bring back something else? Reverence for me feels like an important piece in there, right? Especially to the second part. And there is where I think irreverence is equally important. Hmm. That another piece that was coming in earlier. Why irreverence is, I don't remember that thread, but if I give it a second, I, I, it will come back to me when it, it comes back. It's but an in interesting... Between, Go reverence ahead. Reverence will come back in your narratives earlier as well. Mm. But reverence is equally essential. It's interesting. I think this may be a place where the English language, or at least my vocabulary and command of it, is a little bit impoverished because I don't see reverence and irreverence as tightly opposite as we sometimes position them because of the grammatical construction. Um, I feel like when someone is irreverent, they're more willing to play with something, which can actually be a type of reverence, a type of seeing and holding and appreciating um, a dynamic respect, right? Uh, I'm thinking of, of the potters, right, Megan? And maybe having a really reverent approach to making something and then an irreverent approach to playing with the form um, while still being in a lineage of a particular style. And I, I think 
I was in a um in a session with Teokas and Ghost Horse not long ago, and he talked about how there is no Lakota word for opposite, right? That we pair these things up in these um very dualistic ways. And so I think you're probably right that like it is a combination of irreverence in that willingness to play and also to provide a quality of attention and appreciation for those artifacts and stories of the past that don't make them dead and still and inert and cut off and dusty and sort of museumified um, that would, would be really important in that for me. So it came from side by side in two things. One was the coin and what Megan is trying to do. When you put the coin in picture as an example for Megan, the coin is able to do minutes. It's able to do currency. And when you use it for one, it makes the other irreverent. So hours and skill and ears, all of them can be in the certification, but they need to have not just a linear additive approach. They also have to have an irreverent approach to. Yeah. I don't know what it would look like though, but it has to, that is where I, I wanted to bring irreverence in the, this and that of the, because to make it relational, that certification, I don't know what it looks like. I don't get it. Mm. Yes, Vanessa. Hi. <clears throat> so very interesting. Thank you for your shares so far. Um, for me, my relationship uh, with my grandmother was the strongest because she she I felt that she was that she rec recognized me from a very young age. Uh, so I felt very seen by my grandmother. I think she saw my soul or she saw my potential or she saw she's maybe she saw the importance I would have. Um, and so she wrote a lot to me. So I, I have many, many letters from my grandmother. She lived in Paris, so she would send me many, many letters that later on in life, I would understand that they were meant for me in a different space and time. So she wrote letters to me, even though I was maybe at a younger age, that would only have more significance at a later time. And when, I, when she already passed away or she passed on. And so the relationship, my, the, it was the way even she looked at me or the way she was, she was approaching me that was so important for me and feeling me, feeling myself. And, um, about artifacts so I'm an artist which is also something that has been passed on um, through my um, my lineage but I think I've, 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 I'm the one that has painted most I have so many paintings that um, uh, my son one day we went up to the attic and he's like oh my god mommy what am I supposed to do with this you know and I was feeling oh my god this is a burden for him you know like what you know because it's often with artists or you walk here in Amsterdam, you walk in the streets and you see people that just dump stuff in the street when, when parents pass or something like that, that, you know, a lot of art can be dumped. So it's also, uh, it's, I don't want to be, a, I don't want my art to be a weight on my son. And on, on, on the other hand, if you look at the artists in, in time, but often people are visionaries. So at the time they make it, they are not understood by their uh, generation they are living in at the moment. So it can be musicians, it can be artists, painters. I mean, they never made a, a dime with their art when they were living. And then they, it, they started to make a lot of money or they didn't. But, you know, they're... So I think that, um, as they say about music, that it doesn't belong to a specific time because it can travel in time. I think that art also travels in time and also has different meanings and can apport something to the generations within time. And also, 
I think it's very important to do the work of healing. I keep on repeating myself. The thing of the healing that I, that I, indeed what is passed on to me is not a conditioning, but that it becomes a conscious choice that I am not just repeating blindly whatever has been passed on and I can differentiate and uncondition myself, like unlearning, because if I stand in front of a classroom and I'm conditioned and I'm projecting, I am not doing my work properly. So the healing part of myself to be able to even stand in front of a, another person and not be conditioned from a conditioned place or repetition, just compulsive repetition thing. Yeah, that that for me is the, so it's, that's the work. So the work is healing myself first and then can stand anywhere and just continue creating because I create not to, sell anything but to just to heal myself it's just a it's just a journaling actually through any kind of art that can help me in this moment in time so maybe the energy will pass on later anyway thank you mm, i i really appreciate so much of what you said and especially the part about sort of deconditioning right and like there is a healing process that you're not going to control the timeline on and it's going to be ongoing. But I feel like there's maybe something that happens earlier where more of a switch flips on, I don't want to keep showing up in the ways I was conditioned. That even if you have not reached sort of, I don't know, phases of healing that you aspire to, you can still have that awareness of how you're showing up and holding space, acting, reacting, priming, and um, and to to go back, I'm I'm really feeling this whole thing about containers and vessels has been such a huge theme in my work over the last year. And so, Megan, to have you here with with the Potters and their their learning journey is is just feeling resonant. I feel like what you're also talking about, Vanessa, is art as a vessel for healing, for transmission of knowledge and wisdom and vision across the boundaries of time and space. Um, and that that may be a really important way for us to be presencing um, the interests of the generations that are not alive with us today. Mm -hmm.